Hi and welcome to another video. Today I'll be going over depression. For some background information, depression is a condition that is characterized by persistent sadness and a lack of interest or pleasure from previously rewarding or enjoyable activities. It is the third most common reason for consulting in GP in the UK and it is estimated that over 300 million people have been diagnosed with depression worldwide. The lifetime risk of depression for an individual is 10%, however the female to male ratio is 2 to 1. In terms of the risk factors to be aware of for depression, family history is a very important one, uh, female gender, so as previously mentioned the risk for women having it is 2 to 1, so they're twice as likely to be suffering from depression. Recent bereavement or stress and chronic illnesses are both very important risk factors to keep in mind for depression. In terms of etiology, it is quite complex, but it is believed to be a combination of biological and environmental factors. In terms of biological factors, abnormalities in the HPA axis have been noted to be associated with an increased prevalence of depression. Gut microbiota changes are thought to also contribute to an increased risk of depression. It is thought that there's gut microbiota which produces metabolites which can actually impact neurotransmission in the central nervous system. There could be genetic predisposition, there's a high risk of depression in monozygotic twins, so if one twin is affected the risk of the other one also suffering from depression is much higher. It is also thought that there's a decrease in neurotransmitters in patients with depression, especially when it comes to things like serotonin, sertraline, dopamine, noradrenaline, and it is this main theory that uh, antidepressants are targeting by trying to stimulate an increased production or a decrease in the breakdown of certain neurotransmitters. Anatomical changes, especially in the hippocampal volume, have also been associated with an increased risk of depression. And in terms of the environment, personal life events, significant stresses, again, bereavement, divorce, have been associated with an increased risk. Substance misuse, particularly alcohol and drugs, low socioeconomic status, as well as a lack of proper nutrition and exercise, are all thought to, in some way or form, contribute to the development of depression. In terms of assessing someone for depression, the DSM-5 criteria are most frequently used. With DSM-5 criteria, at least five symptoms over a two-week period need to be present with depressed mood, loss of interest or pleasure, and those are the two key ones. At least one of these two need to be present for a diagnosis to be made. Weight changes, so this could be weight gain or weight loss. Patients may experience changes in appetite, and again, they could be eating more or less, and it is very patient-dependent. Insomnia or hypersomnia, again patients might be sleeping a lot more or a lot less and that could be associated with worrying or simply not being able to shut the brain off or feeling constantly tired and exhausted and not having energy to do anything. There could be psychomotor changes, again those would not be noted by the patients themselves but by the people around them. As previously mentioned with insomnia and hypersomnia there could be fatigue and loss of energy because patients are feeling like they do not have what it takes to cope with what is coming for the rest of the day. Patients may seem distracted, unable to follow through even a simple conversation as if um, their mind isn't fully with whatever you're trying to discuss with them. There could be feeling of worthlessness or guilt and it could be completely unrelated to what is happening around them and it could be a very exacerbated feeling and lastly there could be reoccurring thoughts of death or suicide these patients might not want to complete these thoughts and they might not want to pursue them further but these are thoughts that they have and they come back even if they actively try and stop them. On top of that, certain criteria need to be met. The symptoms that the patients experience must cause clinical distress that must be interfering with their life for a diagnosis to be made. The symptoms cannot be related to any substances or other medical conditions that they might have. It is important the patient has never experienced a manic or hypomanic episode and that the symptoms are not better explained by other 
conditions such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, etc. Now I know that is quite a lot to be aware of and there's a mnemonic called fire damps that I have made that I hope will help a little bit. For F, I put thoughts of suicide. I know it's not the perfect spelling, but it works quite well with the rest of the mnemonic. For I, it would be insomnia and hypersomnia. R for reduced concentration. E for energy loss. D for depressed mood. A for anhedonia or loss of interest. M for meritless or worthlessness. P for psychomotor changes. And S for size changes, aka weight loss or weight gain. And again, I have highlighted the two key signs, which is depressed mood and anhedonia, as again, at least one of them has to be present for a diagnosis to be made. But how would you actually diagnose or investigate someone with depression? There's depression identification questions, which are a great way to open up the conversation. And they are, firstly, during the last month, have you been bothered by feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? And the second one being, during the last month, have you been bothered by having little interest or pleasure in doing things? Those are great opening questions, and they allow the patient to tell you as much or as little as they're comfortable with before you proceed on with the conversation. For the clinical diagnosis, which is key, you require a thorough history and you would use your ICD-11 or the previously mentioned DSM-5 criteria in order to see which which symptoms the patient might be experiencing. Patient Health Questionnaire 9, also called PHQ-9, is a nine-item questionnaire that uses the DSM-5 criteria to help you assess the severity of depression the patient might be experiencing. Anyone with a score of 5 to 9 would be considered mild, 10 to 14 would be considered moderate depression, 15 to 19 moderate to severe, and 20 and above would be considered severe depression. Lastly, you can perform a metabolic panel to help diagnose any potential underlying abnormalities. However, in most patients, it should be normal. With regards to management, firstly, you should consider psychotherapy and it is recommended to all patients who have persistent symptoms and it is first line in mild to moderate depression. Examples of psychotherapy include cognitive behavioural therapy, which is arguably the most common type, problem-solving therapy, and interpersonal therapy. Lifestyle changes are also recommended, so things like exercise, diet changes, any support with substance misuse, particularly alcohol and drugs, and also mindfulness are recommended. Antidepressants are very commonly used to treat depression, so you have SSRIs such as sertraline, SNRIs, such as venlafaxine. These can be used as monotherapy in mild to moderate depression or can be used in conjunction with psychotherapy or other medication in order to treat the symptoms. I have a video on the different types of antidepressants and the side effects that I'll link in the video description. Lastly, there is electroconvulsive therapy and it is used typically in very severe depression in pregnancy or in patients who are resistant to antidepressants. That was a very brief overview of depression as a condition. It is quite a difficult topic, but I hope I have given you a good overview of what you should know when it comes to depression. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments. I hope you consider liking and subscribing for more videos like this. And thank you so much for watching.